back to you tonight about how we could make fuel from algae and why we might want to do it. It requires a lot of imagination, so I think I need to hire some four and five-year-olds based on our last talk, but I'll have to make do with what I have. So before we talk a little bit about algae, let's put this in the big picture. What do we do with a barrel of oil? We get barrels of oil every day from a lot of foreign countries. And what do we do with these? Well, a lot of it goes into making gasoline. Some of it goes into making diesel. Some goes into making jet fuel. And so 10 to 15 years, 20 years from now, I might be driving an electric car, but I probably will not be flying in an electric jet. So we really need to think of some kind of alternative ways to make fuels from things like algae. And besides the fuels that we get from a barrel of oil, we get all kinds of other products from every barrel of oil we import. What are some of these products? Not uh, things like asphalt, plastic bottles, cosmetics. All of these types of things are made from a barrel of oil. So we have to come up with some way to make sustainable oil or barrels of oil from something like algae. So what do you need to grow algae? Not too much. You need sunlight. We have a lot of sunlight here in the desert. We need water and we need some nutrients. So these are what's required, and some of my friends and colleagues at the University of Arizona are growing algae outside at the Campbell Farm at Campbell and Roger in an arid raceway. I personally like to grow things in a lab. I like it when I can control what's going on, and I can grow things, and I can fix the temperature, I can fix how much nutrients I give them, and so I have a little bit more control over the process. So these are some things in my lab. So if it's that easy to grow algae, why aren't we doing it? Why don't we just start making fuel from it right away? Well, there's a couple of problems here and a couple of technology challenges is what I should say. And one of these technology challenges is that the concentration of algae in one of these vessels is very, very low. If you look at this big carboy here, you look at it and you, if I went outside and I saw that in my swimming pool, I would be running down to the store and buying all kinds of chemicals to get rid of that and I would not go near it in the pool. But if you look at this, it's really only about one gram per liter of biomass. What is that? One gram per liter. One gram per liter is like four or five peas in a liter bottle. That's not very much. And one of the technology challenges is it's very expensive to separate that little bit of biomass from all the rest of the water. So what one of the things that we work on in my lab is what if I could make it at 10 grams per liter? or 100 grams per liter. So if I could grow algae in a really concentrated form, you know, like a really icky split pea soup or something, a really concentrated form, then this process then becomes more cost effective. I can separate the water and the biomass better when I've got a lot of biomass to deal with. The one other issue though, is besides sunlight, which we have plenty of here in Tucson, is we also need water. And water, of course, is a resource that is scarce in the desert. And like many of you here, I really like to walk in Sabino Canyon and see the water flowing, maybe play in the water a little bit. And so I need to work on recycling and reusing water when I grow algae. So that's another one of those technology challenges. So I either need to recycle and reuse the water, or 
use some other water source, like wastewater. So yeah, this is that wastewater treatment plant. You know the one. You're driving up I-10, little odor at Prince Road. If I could use the water from this to grow the algae, then I'm not depleting one of our precious natural resources. There's one other really great thing about algae. We know how to do some of the stuff associated with it. So on the outside of an algae cell, there's a, there could be a lot of oil. And we already know how to convert that oil into diesel and jet fuel. Those processes are pretty well understood. We're not so sure how to convert those into all the other things, the plastics and stuff we need, but we'll figure that out in short order. But all of the green part of the algae, it's got a lot of protein and a lot of carbohydrate. And so that's a food source. So one of the great things about algae is you can get fuel and food at the same time. So, you know, I can't figure all this stuff out by myself. So one of the things that we do is you work in a really big team. So the University of Arizona is part of a really big team of 13 universities, three government labs, and about 10 companies. And as a big consortium, we're working on figuring out how we take algae and turn it into biofuels, bioproducts, and feed economically and in a sustainable way. And in the really big picture, what we want to do is make a biofuels industry in the United States. And really, wouldn't it be great if we could have a lot more jobs in sunny places like Arizona where we could make biofuels? So for all the things that I do and all the cool places I get to go and people I get to meet, the really main reason why I really like what I do is all the students that I work with. So this is a picture of my student team. It's a mixture of undergraduate students, graduate students, and a postdoc from the University of Arizona. And there's nothing better than seeing one of these students discover something new and the excitement in their face when they're solving problems. But there is one catch if you work in the Ogden lab. All of these people have to be involved in outreach activities. So they can't just be little lab rats. They have to get out and share what they learn with the community. How do they do this? Well, some of them, as graduate students, actually spend 10 or 20 hours a week in a junior high or high school classroom working with kids. Or some of them mentor teachers, like this junior high teacher from Flowing Wells Junior High. She comes and she works with some of these people in the summer for five or six weeks. The whole goal of these outreach activities is so that we can interest more of our youth in science and engineering. And it couldn't be better than to work on problems that will make the world a better place in the future for other generations and for my kids, David and Matthew in particular. Thank you.